So welcome back to the post lunch session. Um, so before we announce uh, the speaker, let me just uh, have a quick announcement. So we'll have a group photograph taken after this talk. So around 3.30 we have asked uh, Shrimati Gayatri who is our media in charge to take a group photo. So uh, she will decide where exactly would be the optimal location. Either it would be just in front of the auditorium complex or it could be in front of the library. So uh, we'll see, you know, like when finally people are assembled, how large a space we need. So just, you know, be around the entrance to this auditorium around 3.30 so that we could all get assembled in a quick time and get the photo done. All right, so it's my pleasure to now, uh, you know, introduce uh, speaker for the current session, uh, Professor Mayang Vahia of formerly of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. So Mayank is uh, an astronomer. Um, however, through his interest in Archean astronomy, he went into the area of Indus Valley Civilization and has subsequently done seminal work on this area. And um, today he will be speaking on, uh, you know, going more beyond the specific context of Indus script to look at how do we connect the script to its culture? So without further ado, let me invite Mayank to give his talk. Thank you very much, uh, Sitabra. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk in the conference on bits and script. And apart from sounding nice, I think it's an important, it's an interesting title. Uh, the interesting thing is that the duration of any information um, and the medium on which you write is inversely proportional. Stone inscri inscriptions can be read for um, 5,000 years, but something read on a floppy disk can't be read for more than 10 years. But that's, that's, that's a question. 10 years if you're lucky, exactly, and paper is few hundred years and so on. Anyway, um, so when Sitabra told me to attend this conference, and I'm grateful for that, uh, I was wondering about what this writing and script mean. Essentially, writing and script are not, language, writing and language are not related. They're independent inventions uh, driven by various reasons why writing is invented. Uh, Sitabra talked to you about history of uh, writing, but there, there are philosophical aspects about what writing means, why is it invented, how is it invented, why do you select a particular style of writing. In that sense, language helps to decide the kind of style of writing you will write, but otherwise, um, writing is an independent entity. Devanagari you can use for all the Indian languages, Roman alphabet you can use for all the Roman, all the European languages and so on. So there, there's a very ambivalent relation between uh, writing and uh, language. The other problem is when you come across a culture like the Harappan culture, which is which, whose only evidence is archaeological and no other evidence exists. And then you have a script which is even more cryptic and Nisha in the morning showed you how, how tricky the whole thing has become about uh, reading the Indus script, you start getting questions about writing, language, reading, meaning, purpose of writing. And I'm going to talk about some of these issues using Harappan script as the underlying example. Um, so the first question, as soon as I get this working, is just to take a note. So Sita, uh, Nisha Yadav, Sitabra, others have done a lot of work on Indus script. Uh, Nisha and I started what 2006 or something. It's been it's been a long journey. Um, but I'm going to talk about a wider issue of what is writing and use Harappan civilization as a context for that. And uh, so I will, um, I will I will look at those issues. But Harappan writing has a very peculiar set of difficulties. The first thing is the sheer compactness of writing, and that everything was written on miniatures. And then we'll try and put the whole thing in context. And I would like to begin by paying my respect to Airavatam Mahadevan, a resident of Chennai who passed away about two or three years ago. And uh, he's by far the greatest scholar in the field of um, 
Harappan script. So he first encouraged, um, sh give Shiromani. A young man died very early, but did some very early work on digitization of Indus script. Then, of course, we were there, Sita Brahe there. We have all benefited from his learning. And that is a little whiteboard in my office where he sat and explained the whole thing to us. Um, so we are talking about miniatures and writing. India's miniatures are a very peculiar set of objects, OK? And that seems to have been their choice of um, expression. They loved miniatures and they stuck with miniatures. And the size was what? 1.5 to 15 centimeters. 15 centimeters was itself un unusual. 3 to 5 centimeters was their common choice of um, seals on which they wrote, whatever they, they choose, whether they use copper or whether they use terracotta, they wrote on about 5 centimeter size things. The miniatures were also used for such a large variety of purposes that you have no clue how many how many things they did with that. Okay? Apart from writing, they, have, they do, did a lot of interesting things on these miniatures. But almost all the written material is on the miniatures. Uh, some of these miniatures have have a holding at the back, which seems to suggest that it was probably used as a rubber stamp. But then in that case, we haven't found as many copies of the original seal as we would have liked to. They are far and few and far apart. And they aren't as many of them. So they made these molds, they made the mold holdable by a grip, but they didn't emboss it to make more copies. And uh, what they did, I do have no clue. Probably now Mahadevan has an idea. He had promised to send us a mail from promised to send an H mail. Anyway, the story is that the medium of choice of expression for the Harappans was this, and we don't know what they were doing. So they, these are some of the stylistic things that they did. Okay. Then there is, there is a three-headed uh, animal. Clearly, the three animals are different. Then there is that uh, somebody had talked about the seal in the morning, about the seven sisters and so on. And it's a very complicated seal. You can interpret it any way you like. And on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, it is an astronomy text for me. On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, it is a funerary practice. And on Saturdays, I don't think. The other one, Mahadevan has interpreted as a, the first recorded bullfighting competition in India. He says this is the bull with its arrogant uh, head and all the human beings being thrown away by the bull. This is another interesting seal with its U-shaped. And these are all five centimeter objects, mind you. The image that you see is what, three to five times larger than the original object. This is what fascinated us the most, this and these, these four. And Sitabra, Nisha, and I have a paper on this. It is almost impossible to make this on a three centimeter piece of mud. Okay? You can see the geometric precision. They have never had to compromise except for a little bit here. More or less, they have managed to maintain the pattern completely all through on a three centimeter object without any machining or tooling technologies. And look at this. This is, again, three centimeters across. There are rings within rings with geometric precision. So one, even with a compass now, it would be difficult to get this kind of precision and accuracy. And this is a fascinating object because it has a geometric shape I will talk about in a minute. And this looks like a fountain. So they were doing lots of things with this medium. And as Nisha also quoted earlier, it would be no exaggeration to describe them as little masterpieces of controlled realism. They managed to put in a whole bunch of their realism within these objects. And they are of monumental strength because come in some sense completely out of proportion of their size and on the other hand entirely related to it. So you could relate that bullfight uh, without too much of difficulty and yet it is a three centimeter size object completely out of proportion to what the real event must have been like and yet a complete representation of that reality. And that is what makes just looking at this hair up and seal so fascinating. Okay, so about the uh, seals, they are a masterful combination of artistic imagination, high, speed, high degree of precision, creative technology, objective clarity, and they express themselves uh, uh, almost exclusively in the medium of uh, terracotta pieces or copper pieces. There are no large artwork pieces from Harappa. They are all in miniatures. There is some claim of a game board being found in Dolavira, but again, those examples are, and that would be about 
15 centimeters by 15 centimeters, but those are very rare. It's a culture that simply loved miniatures. Nowhere in the entire human ex civilization do you find this kind of obsession with miniatures. So the kind of rolled seal that Nisha showed you, those kind of seals were made by Mesopotamian contemporaneous to Harappans, but really um, nobody used them as extensively as, as uh, the Harappans did. Mesopotamia does have some rotating miniature seals and the Harappan seals have a parallel development, but uh, there's nothing like this anywhere in the universe. And this is a uh, thing that I'm talking about. This little three tiger heads over here had this pattern in the middle. That pattern is similar to the pattern over here. And that pattern is not a random pattern. It is the way circles are fitted to give you the pattern you need, and it is also on large scale objects, which is very rare, like I said, for Harappans. There's a very nice water jug from Harappa, which also has the same patterns. And imagining this kind of geometry is not easy. We are talking about an extremely sophisticated civilization with a great understanding of geometry, all of which remains um, ununderstood. There are also other parts, there are unusual animals. There's an animal like this, a tiger-human interface. This is another one, Nisha showed you this. So I'm going to skip that, but you can see the number of complex animals that are built in. And unicorn, for example, the one that I like the most is a horse with a, with a horn, which obviously doesn't exist. Um, even in Harappan, people have searched for skulls of the horse, the wild asses, etc. there. There's absolutely no evidence of an animal of that kind. So what are seals? Why, why, I mean, why choose seals? First of all, they are easy to carry. You can carry them around wherever you want. They are easy to make uh, under expert training. Once you have learned the trick, you will love this medium. Indian miniature paintings, for example, are also famous, but they are much larger than this. The kind of sophistication that Harappans had is not there. On the other hand, they didn't have the kind of details that Indian miniature paintings have. They were temper-proof. It is very easy, difficult to sort of erase part of the writing and stuff like that, and therefore they were temper-proof. They were difficult to create and replicate unless you knew exactly what you were doing or unless you had the original mold or something. So they, they, were, they, were, they were unique in many, many sense of the word, and they're an explicit proof in some sense of centralized training, because you cannot say anything, everything that you want to say in say four or five signs, and everybody and I expect somebody a thousand kilometers away to understand, unless somebody has a dictionary to know the meaning of each of the sign. The more miniature, the more compact your information, the bigger is the dictionary you need to read what is written. And so, almost certainly, Harappans must have had a centralized training. Harappan civilization is known for its spread of more than a million square kilometers, and yet highly standardized in terms of brick sizes, writing style, the knives that they use, the weight balances that they use. There are some 14 characteristics which are common to all Harappan sites, spread over a million square kilometers. Clearly, they had somebody to whom this information was being transported. Okay? In the absence of evidence of standing army, it must be assumed that all this was done by consensus. There is very little evidence of army in Harappan civilization, practically none, okay? Uh, this itself speaks a lot about what culture you're talking about. Again, a few more seals, but this time there is something more to it, and that is uh, that there is writing on the top. So there are writing over here, there is writing over here, and so on. And then there is this tiger. So this, this more particular motif of a tiger whose head is turned and a, a person on the top is a seal that has been seen in many cases, there are two cases over here. There is also this great human killing two tigers, and this probably has been compared with the Gilgamesh story that was being that was mentioned in the morning. You have another example of that kind of thing. In this case, the face is actually seen here. It is not seen. And there are a lot of other animals. So something very, very obviously profound was going on as far as these seals were concerned. So the script. Now, the first thing you realize is that writing is something that, enco that encounters a language from the outside rather than flowing directly from inside. Language does not lead to script. Even today, we have Konkani language in Maharashtra, which doesn't have a script. They use the Nagri script, but that is a recent um, medicine. So there is no written literature of uh, early Konkani language because it was not written. The formal script 
encodes formal information. You decide you have information which you cannot now transmit simply by talking or discussion or even messengers. You start worrying about putting it in a manner where that material can be carried unambiguously. You want to make sure that the matter is formal. You want to make sure that the matter is written in a unambiguous manner and that it is transported over long distances. Writing system can code multiple languages like I said so. Writing is probably intended for a variety of purpose. It can aid memory. If I don't remember something, I write it down and keep it to make sure that I remember. It can mark ownership. I can write my name on the things that belong to me. I can use it for trading. I can use it for accounting. The early writing almost certainly was um, commercial. It was not, in case of Harappa, it was definitely not invented to express ideas in writing. The average size scale is uh, five signs per uh, per writing, maximum is 16 on one side, 24 total. And the average is about 5.3 or something. And there are many, many seals of just one sign. So it was definitely not a poetry writing competition by any stretch of imagination. It is most, this is most evidence when you consider that the, uh, the, the modern human languages, mathematics for example, is extremely common. The best of the human languages, mathematics is so much more compact. And um, reading it out is so much more complicated than it does. And yet it is so complex. So, so the closest you have is something like this. But it's clearly not numeric system and I'll show you evidence of that. Uh, it was used to express ideas uh, the idea that writing can be used to express thought is not something the Harappans seem to have used. When they had thoughts, they probably drew and did abstract activities. So why write? The practice of writing and the development of a coherent system of sign or a script is something that is seen in complex society. Writing is a feature of civilization. You will not bother to write until you have become a civilization. A, a culture will not write, a society will not write, a group of people living together in a commune will not write. Writing is needed when you become civilization. It is large, it is complex, it has multiple rules, but multiple organizational features, and multiple development sources and all that. Until civilization comes, writing doesn't come. We write for three primary reasons. One is to aid memory and uh, mark ownership. One is to communicate over long distances. And the third is for trading arithmetic. I'm sending five kilos of onions and you send me three kilos of potatoes or whatever. Uh, the speculations on the Harappan writing are the following. Uh, some people have suggested that they, have, they were taxed for securing goods and storage rooms and stuff like that. I'm leaving so much of material in a store or whatever. Identification material saying that this particular package has um, this particular material in it. Uh, token as primitive coinage saying that um, against this uh, coin you give me so much of barter and there is a set of some 30 odd seals of just three symbols which seem to at one place at one time which might potentially have been something similar like this. Religious purposes as amulets uh, for protection etc could have been also used. But I mean, it's obvious that if you take each of these, you will find counterexamples in the Harappan civilization to show that this cannot be the sole, be the only purpose. The medium that they used was temper-proof and durable, and uh, they also, we, we really do not know what Harappan spoke. Like I said, all the evidence for Harappan civilization is archaeological. We have absolutely no literary or other evidence. The later on, um, Vedic people who come have no idea that their cities existed in this place and so on. And I will show you there are a lot of reasons why Vedic people could not have known about the Harappans. The only evidence we have is this um, archaeological. Okay. So a right, um, piece of writing in Harappa has three components. One is the script itself that I showed you. The second, in many, many cases, I don't remember the statistics, but I think about 40-50% of the cases, you get an animal drawn underneath. And there is some kind of uh, jar in front which has been suggested to be a feeding cup, but each animal has its own unique uh, feeding cup as it were. And uh, we have no clue what it means. 
uh, we have many seals with only one or two items. Um, so th there are seals where there is only script, there are seals where there are only animals, but, and, but there are never a seal with only the feeding cup, I think, except maybe one or two examples. Uh, where there is only a feeding cup and the written on the top, but that is very rare. In most cases, if you have an animal, chances are that you will have a feeding cup. Uh, you can have script alone, you can have animal alone, but feeding cup alone is, like I said, very rare. Uh, the writing contains somewhere between 20 and 650 signs, depending on who you ask. The same little bit of writing, depending on who you ask, will count anything from 650 signs in Harappan writing, same corpus. Same photograph, same seals, same objects. Somebody will say it has 650 signs and somebody else will say it is 20 signs. The reason is that there is this addendum. Nisha showed you that table where there were 21 additives that went only on those signs. If you don't know Hindi, Hindi has 650 signs. I actually sat and counted because ka, ka, ki, ki, ke, ko, everything becomes a separate letter, separate, separate sign. So if you have an Abugida language or a language or four where, um, oh, where uh, consonants and uh, vo, verbs are mixed, co, consonants and um, anyway, the, so, the A, E, I, O, U is mixed with A, B, C, D. Now in English they keep it separate, so we know it is 26 letters at the most if you take capital separately, twice that much. But in uh, Abugida languages where, where consonants and uh, the sound are mixed, uh, I, E, E, will look different from ka, ka, ki, ki, etc. and you will end up with 650 signs. Madhavan himself preferred 400 and, uh, 478 signs and he says maybe there is one more sign in his introduction, he writes about one more sign. But the, the number has not gone up much. But um, there are people who have used the same corpus, same catalog and say no, no, there are 650 signs and so on. So we don't even know how many signs are there in writing. Uh, the writing, uh, those who claim the smallest number claim basically that the language, that the script is Abu Ghida, it mixes consonants and vowels, that is what I was looking for. Consonants and vowels are mixed um, and therefore you apparently have 650 signs, just as Hindi would have 600 odd signs, uh, not because it has 600 odd characters, but because it is Abu Ghida. This suggests that the script was Abu Ghida and um, I must confess that even Nisha is not really convinced that I say this, the statement is correct. So not many people take this, but this is my personal opinion that this mixes vowels and consonants and that is why we have so many signs. Uh, a premier, uh, mathematics, for example, there are many obvious examples of Abu Ghida's English language. When you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, you can write at least uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, but for example, in Roman numerals, you combine the two sticks of two together to make you five in a V shape and so on, where you have mergers of signs to get higher values. It is extremely useful for coding languages. One of the things, nice thing that Avogadro does is it keeps the pronunciation inside, which um, purely alphabetic languages don't. Uh, the writing is highly ordered. Anisha gave you a whole one and a half hour lecture on that. I hardly need to talk about it. It is both highly ordered and yet flexible. It is written from right to left. We have fairly good evidence that it is written from right to left. Some 20% of the seals, I think, are ambiguous, but otherwise it is written from right to left. And that is probably they were chiseling. So if you are chiseling and doing, then it's easy to write right to left because you can read what is written. Uh, it is always um, a small string, like I said, average is five. Uh, uh, we know of a transition from Porter Potter's mark uh, to complete uh, script and I will show you and the transition is very swift. Nisha showed you that it's a matter of, I will show you the slides again. It's a matter of few decades before it, before, uh, at the most a couple of hundred years before they go into from Porter's mark, Potter's mark to writing and disappears, the language disappears also as dramatically. So between the last of Harappan writing to the first of Brahmi writing, there's a thousand year period when nobody wrote anything. And that means we have no continuity. The writing was highly standardized in terms of even the size of each character, the shape of each character and so on over the entire region of Harappan civilization. And this is important because Harappan civilization was 1.5 million square kilometers, somewhere between 1 and 1.5 million square kilometers depending on who you ask. It went from southern Gujarat to Kashmir, it went from pa eastern Pakistan to the run of Kutch. The sign designs are very similar. Okay, Nisha showed you that region to region variations are really very small. The medium of writing is very similar. Most of the writing is in terracotta and then 
either baked or pre-baked or in post-baking and so on. And the sequence of texting is similar. So the grammar is, is fairly well known as Nisha showed you. The signs that seem to have been used uh, only uh, locally are very few and far, very rare, genuinely very rare. So evolution of writing, Nisha showed you this slide. Harappan civilization's first um, urbanization that you see, um, 7000 BC in, in um, somewhere over here uh, is the first Harappan site. And then by 3200 BC, they have come to both the uh, Gangetic Plain and to probably another river that was floating here called Gagarakra. But they have discovered both these regions and they spread. So by 7000 to 3200 BC, they spread, but they still don't write. So potter's mark, etc., come in. Well, they are sufficiently settled and they start making pottery and stuff like that. And that is when you get the first set of um, pre firing graffiti. So the pot was made, signs were made, and then it was baked to give you the hardened thing. But there is no grammar in this. The grammar comes between 2500 and 2800 BC, in a period of 300 years or less. The spread is much larger. Now we are talking about going all the way from the entire Pakistan even into Afghanistan and on the east, to the east of uh, the Gagarakara River. The Indus River is here. Gagarakara was supposed to have flown like that. They, they probably found it difficult to go further east because the jungles were thick. But now you have proper grammatical writing. Nisha showed you several examples of taking these signs and showing how they matched and so on. From these writings, Mahadevan created the corpus which remains by far the best corpus in the subject. There are three, more, three or four more corpuses. But you can see that he gave each of the, for each seal that he had, he wrote down the entire string that was written. Like I said, the writing is from right to left. And that is why you get this jar sign that Nisha talked about being at the end in many, many cases, but not all the cases. And the length, you can see varied. So the writing, we know it has a clear semantic structure, uh, syntactic structure. It has a um, semantic value, we don't know. It has a very clear syntactic structure. It normally has been assumed to be. So, so people have obviously suggested that, look, when you're starting to decipher an unknown script, start with numbers. Vertical signs are nice numbers. Okay? The problem with Harappans is that even vertical signs have variations in the sense that is this number two is the same as number two here because there are these four additives here, there are all kinds of additives over here. But even then, if you assume that this is number one and these are the variants of number one, where are the variants of number one? These two are variants of number one and so on. If you do that, you can make a table of the Harappan the Mahadevan sign number and the number of occurrences they have. Forget reading the numbers, look at the picture. So what I have here is sign number 86 to sign number 117. So, uh, this sign represents um, the number 1 as I showed you. The simplest form again appears 149 times, the other two appear 99 and 91, 88 times. The sign that appeared like 2, a particular variant of it appears for 1044 uh, times. Uh, sorry, it appears uh, 649 times. The second variant is uh, 365 times and the third variants are 29 and 1 time. Over on the top you have so number of occurrences of 1. 1A, 1, 1, 1A, 1, 1B together is 328. 2, 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D is 1044 and so on. But you can see that if there were numbers, the user would not, usage would not be so random. You would expect at least all the centralized number 1s to be used in the same manner, even if you assume that these other things mean something else, then number 1, number 2, Number three should have same frequency of usage, or at least a comparable frequency of usage. That is nowhere near true. So clearly, vertical strokes don't mean numbers. Okay? So the obvious landmarks that you would use for decipherment are not available. Okay? There seems to be a complex relation between writing and animal motives. Uh, yes? Sorry? Frequency doesn't have to be uniform, right? For it to be no, not, not, not absolutely uniform, but you surely you don't have this kind of difference where number 1 appears 649 times and number 9 or 10 appears once or 0 times. Um, I mean, if I'm doing trading, all kinds of numbers will come up, no? So Everything will not be 1 kilo. So, for example, the frequency of 1 being so low, huh? 
maybe it means that one is implied in many contexts. You don't need to explain. Yeah, so right that way. that is a question of interpretation then. Okay. If I go by purely statistical use, if I take a book okay. of uh, say a trader and ask how, how many numbers appear how many times, you'll essentially get a flat, flat distribution. That's what I mean. Mm. See, this is too dramatic. 649 to 1. Okay, if it had been say plus minus, forget about root n. Even if it was five times root n, I would have believed it. But 649 to 1 is a very vast difference. No, I don't remember. Then that. if you remove 649, then also it is 365, 314. And um, essentially, by the way, this follows uh, Ziff's law. I checked that. The number of, um, if you rank the thing, 10, uh, this 649 and 1, then 365, 314, 149, and do that, it follows Ziff's law. I don't know why. Um, accounting, sometimes you look at these statistics where you look at the first digit distribution. Yes, so they what? They tend to have a very skewed distribution, right? Yes, it, uh, no, no, if you mean take only the first digit of the number every time. Even oh. then, even then, I can't think of an example unless somebody is just selling you one gram gold or something. I mean, typically businessmen would have, they would have fixed units because gold and silver are sold in. The, but even then, only one and two numbers are difficult to find out. Especially given that the design in which they appear are even more complicated. Sorry? The design with which they appear, like this fellow, is it really a number? It's is almost impossible to guess. Because this, the, the protrusion you see, is actually an independent sign. Okay? So this, for example, uh, is, is a known additive amongst the 21 Nisha listed out. Okay, so clearly this means number plus whatever that additive was supposed to mean. This means the number three plus whatever additive that was supposed to mean, even if you assume that three is a number. That is where the problem comes in. And the fact that we have only 5,000 odd writing doesn't really help. Okay, so I just wanted to show you this example that um, we don't know what is going on. And obvious rules are not going to work. There is a complex relations between um, writing and animal motifs and um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about it simply because I'm not competent but there is Bhaskar here who lives in Chennai who has done some beautiful work in associating these animal motifs to writing something that is unique because Mahadevan and other people have also ignored this possible relation between animal motifs and uh, the writing and Bhaskar has some very nice ideas and statistics about what the relation may be. Similarly, the writing, um, similarity with written, li written writing doesn't exist. So people have tried to interpret this as Dravidian, people have tried to interpret it as Sanskrit. There are people who can read sans whole Sanskrit shlok from Rugved in those five letters and stuff like that. But that's obviously way beyond reality. Dravidian and Sanskrit two models have been tried and um, it's easier to show that they fail rather than succeed. Uh, there have been a hundred, more than 100, more like 150 uh, interpretations of the writing. Everything from somebody claiming that is completely random uh, gibberish to somebody claiming that is all numbers and numerics to somebody claiming that it is various known and unknown languages, etc. The linguistic models do not stand up. So you assign meanings to it and say, okay, fine, I assign, say, arbitrarily 10 meanings to 10 signs. And they say, say, what is the relation expected between the ten? And the patterns don't match. What Nisha says and what these interpreters say are two are at variance. And it's easy to show that, unfortunately. All of them fail to meet the strict criteria of what the writing should be. Okay, so this is, for example, Mahadevan's again sign list Nisha showed you. I've shown only 50, and I've shown you his corpus. And published in 1977, it still remains a classic. There is not more than 10% addition to, 10 or 15% addition to this corpus since he wrote it. There, these are the things that Nisha again showed you. If you look at these signs in Mohanjadaro and Harappa, you can see that the usage is more or less standard except for minor variants in smaller signs. Similarly, if you take text beginners, they are essentially the same everywhere. Text enders are the same everywhere. The standardization over 1 million square kilometers is not so easy. Even Hindi numerals, the way they are, the, the, now of course, government of India forces everybody to use uh, Roman numerals, but otherwise, the number written in one is very, in Hindi is very different from the one written in Marathi and one written in Gujarati and so on. We can't standardize over our nation unless you artificially rule it. And here they had 
a standardization without a central army imposing the whole thing. So these are the various corpuses that have come up. Hunter's corpus 31, 34, he had um, 750 objects, he had no clue what they were and he said there were 288 signs and 149 signs at variance. Uh, um, Mahadevan M77 comes uh, in 19, Ma, so Ma, Maregi has one in 1934, 750 pieces and he says there are 277. Mahadevan's uh, 1977 corpus, 2006 it was, fi the, the most recent version was published, um, 3537 texts with total number of signs is 13,000 and he says there are 417 signs plus two additional signs and so on. Uh, Parpola Moralis co-published or just before Mahadevan did or around, Mahadevan and Parpola essentially talk to each other all the time and you can see that um, Mahadevan had, sorry, 2,900 objects, he had 3,200 objects. Since then the number of objects has gone up from about 3,000 to 4,500 and uh, the number of signs you can suggest has gone up from 288 signs to Mahadevan's 417 to 676 or even 704 signs depending on who you talk to but the number of written material was 13,000 for Mahadevan and 19,000 for full. So the, the, the data is there, whatever data we could accumulate and the amount of data changes are not significant. So writing and animal motives, um, like I said, I'm going to refer you to Bhaskar for more work that he has done. If you want, you can contact him. But the, the unicorn, for example, had a variety of decorations, variety of stripes, variety of um, dec um, ornaments and so on. This is documented by Parpola and you could see that these animals and we don't know why. That they were just not um, unicorn motifs but those unicorn motifs also had different designs within them for reasons we do not know and this is Ma, this is um, Bhaskar's work completely and where he talks about these various signs and the motifs that come with that and he identifies various linguistic structures and all that that go into it but that's not what we are talking about today, we are talking about script and Harappan or writing in general. Script unfortunately suddenly disappears in 1700 BC. It just, there is no written material from 70, after 1700 BC. And um, the next script, um, uh, Brahmi doesn't come up till 300 BC or 400 if you want to be generous. Uh, essentially, Harappan civilization ends at that time. Um, so the last of the urban uh, centers in Harappa is seen around 1700 BC. After that there are some villages that seem to have survived for a little bit but not long. Why they disappeared is a mystery because there was certainly no violence anywhere. None of these cities were destroyed by war. Um, it was also um, not one site at a, at a time. Within a matter of a couple of hundred years all the say, urban sites disappeared. So it is not that one city died and um, then others also decided to leave or something. There have been some suggestion of natural changes, but uh, depending on where you dig, you get different kind of evidences of monsoon failures and stuff like that. So the situation is such that you can take any argument about why Harappan died and I'll take the opposite argument and we'll never agree. It is that confused. Lots of data exists, but it is mutually contradictory in many, many cases. Elec economic collapses is another possibility because Harappans were the biggest traders to West Asia and West Asian civilization, Ma Mesopotamia and all, died down around the same time that Harappans died. So maybe they were primarily dependent on international trade and that collapse of the economy collapse, we don't know. There are some claims of scattered, scattered examples, but um, they are, not, they are so far not strong evidences. So Mahadevan, for example, thought there was an axe in South India that seemed to have Harappan signs, etc. But this evidence is not very strong. There are some bronzes in Maharashtra which have been suggested. There are some artifacts in Tamil Nadu which have been suggested. But there is no strong and statistically significant evidence. The civilization appeared and disappeared as, as dramatically as it did and therefore we have no idea. So let us look at writing and the context. I was telling you that writing and uh, language are two different contents. And the problem with India, like I said, Harappan evidence is all archaeological, Vedic evidence is all literary. We really have no evidence, for example, even of a war as, as big as Mahabharata. Um, and therefore it is difficult, if not outright impossible, to reconcile the two. 
uh, where Harappan civilization was certainly local in the sense that the genetically Harappan people seem to have genetic uh, relation to people of South Iran, South East Iran. But there is no evidence of great trades. Mesopotamia in Iraq is further away. And therefore, even though they traded, they seem to have independently developed. The writing, for example, is so different that it, one could not have learned from the other. The architecture of Harappan civilization unique, is unique. The technology is unique. Several and good and bad features of Harappan uh, Mesopotamian culture were not seen in Ma of Mesopotamia were not seen in Harappa. Many of Harappan things were not seen in Mesopotamia. The relation was strictly a trader's relation. Genetic archaeology data suggests that Harappans were close to the farmers of Iran, but their genetic signature does not go beyond that. They were not people who wrote Vedic literature, we know that for sure. For one, um, Vedic, liter Vedic literature is very strong on horse, and Vedic literature explicitly says that they are talking about a horse with 27 ribs, because Harappans have ass, asses, and asses have only 26 ribs in the spinal cord. And the Vedic people are very particular that we don't wo worship this asses with 27 ribs, we worship the horse that has 27 ribs. There are no cities in Rugwe. Various attempts have been done to try and retrofit it, but it doesn't work. Rugwe people essentially ate barley, which is not the primary crop of India, while Harappans ate rice and wheat. And there are other evidences. So one of the ways of looking at civilization and development is to look at this. You start with about 10,000 BC when there are hunter-gatherers, by about 7,000 when hunter-gathering became, area requirement becomes very large, they reach saturation and then they tend to start farming. Then they remain semi-nomadic, both hunting and farming, until that gives you the maximum resource it can. Then they come up with larger settlements and organization. When that saturates, they go into urbanization because urbanization is most efficient in terms of value for money, and then they suddenly collapse for reasons that we do not understand, okay? And they simply scatter all over the place. And this is typically what happens when demographic pressure becomes maximum for this kind of lifestyle, when resource available is maximally optimized, and demand for technology is, comes in, people go through a phase transition into other forms of culture. Over here, the script comes over here, and the script Sorry, I'll show you where the script disappears. Anyway, uh, why did this fall occur is something that you can you can argue indefinitely. We really, like I said, have no evidence. Uh, demographic pressure, sudden changes in environment, failure to come up with new technologies or ideologies, a whole bunch of things can be done. But we really do not know. Um, so this is how the Harappan population goes. So this is again 7000 BC, 2000. BC, and what you have in red, uh, blue color are the urban sites, what you have in red color are the rural sites, and you can see uh, the script appears here, the script disappears here, and about the time that the script disappears, even the urbanization disappears. So this is the Gujarat region, this is the Indus region, and this is the Yamuna region, and you can see that the number of um, urban sites declines dramatically around the time the script disappears. The, the semi-urban side or rural sites do tend to survive for a little, but eventually they disappear. And you identify Harappan sites as being Harappan because they should have two, three or four of the standard 14 technologies. There are not of non-Harappan villages also amongst them, but they do not show any of the classical Harappan urbanization. Uh, you can do something more. You can say, what are the important parameters for which? So here we have a list of 26 parameters. And we talk about how important was it to nomads or to rural people or to urban people and so on. And you can take these 26 parameters of uh, cultural parameters and evaluate them for different phases of their life. And then you can make a network diagram. And it turns out that in the earliest phases, what essentially counts is the population density, the use of transport to hunt, a bit on the leadership, integration amongst the people, and sensitivity to environment. Other parameters don't matter. Then from nomad, when you go to uh, settled far settlement farming, essentially now some of the other parameters disappear, but population density, expertise in farming, and so on become more important. So uh, environment, population density, external threat, and expertise become important. 
when you go urban, lots of new parameters come up. You have to worry about integration of population, stratification, housing, religious parameters, inter internal communication, sciences, in terms of technology development, mathematics, and so on. A whole bunch of parameters come up where writing becomes a part of that story. And when you are post-urban, many of these settlements, uh, many of these parameters disappear, and you are reduced to a fewer set of parameters where expertise and uh, metal now become central to the story. So you can look at these kind of issues to say where the writing appeared. And writing appears along with leadership quality, somewhat similarly important in this network of parameters that defined life. Religion comes to the center, population density more or less is the center of the focus of the entire urbanization. But writing and leadership are still peripheral. They are still, not everybody writes, not everybody reads, and it is still an exclusive business of the elite. Another interesting thing about Harappan civilization, like I said, that the spread of 1.5 million square kilometers is not, not uniform. So what I have here is that you take each site and count the number of sites that are there from each site, and then you make a co-add all together. So typically, if you have a site over here, typically within about first 20, 30 kilometers, you will have another site. Then there is a big um, uh, chi, if you wish, and then around 400 kilometers, you get a second peak of size. So essentially, the, the distribution of population is not uniform. But can there, be some bias in this there could be some bias, but not so much, because this is in across all the periods. So I'm saying in terms of, uh, uh, Searching for sites. Uh, there no so um, I don't think that there's been a systematic uh, attempt like that because some of these sites are typically a few hundred meters so you would look for a neighbor the question that comes up is uh, what is the catchment area that a big city requires okay so for example Mumbai and Pune are two cities that I can think of which are about 300 kilometers apart if you try to put a city in the middle of the two the resource stretch would be so much that it would not be possible to make it exist Okay, because urban populations require a huge catchment area. So that is like saying Chennai and Bangalore are, are Chennai and Bangalore are 300 kilometers apart, but Bangalore yeah. is more or less in the middle. So uh -huh. I think Mumbai and Pune are separated by the Western Ghats. That's the reason. Yeah, that is part of the story. But what are the stories also? The, so Mom Mumbai and Surat, for example, we are staying essentially in the same plateau. Or in the Konkan, we have Goa in the south. Some are geographic parameters will definitely play a role, but. Um, so, for example, in between Mumbai and Pune, there are Khandala and others which will not get full development. You try to fully develop and the, the resource crunch that they will take in terms of vegetables, milk, um, garbage, etc., will make it impossible. And you see that here. That's all I'm saying. So, what I have here is this multiple graphs over multiple periods. This was 5000 BC going to 3500 BC and so on and so forth. And this is the peak period of uh, Harappan civilization and then subsequently. And this gap remains. So if you look at the look at the social dynamics of it, this is the um, peak civilization period where the distance is much larger actually. Okay, and writing appears in this uh, red phase, 3000 to 2500 BC, after which, in fact, patterns settle. This, this is about a 200 kilometer gap. Define the number of sites. You mean like there are 10,000 urban uh, sites in one uh, between 400? I, I didn't get that. What is number of sites? Number of sites is essentially okay. So what happens here is that we have defined that anything that is more than half a square kilometer in area is called an urban site. Okay. And so this is the number of uh, the area. So. There are, for example, about, um, there are uh, the biggest site has an area of about seven square kilometer. Here, the biggest site has about same, same seven kilometers. But in the Yamuna region, the biggest sites have almost an area of 15 kilometers square. The okay. size of the urban so, area. Yeah, so go, going back to what, what you are showing. So yeah. if, if you say 10,000 sites, it can be, a, or a 4,000 site can be one contiguous cluster. Yes, yeah, so the clustering when you do, this is what you get. This is what you get. So if you say nearest only 100 site kilometer sites are connected, you get four different clusters. If you say, okay, connection goes up to 200 kilometers, now these sites are appearing bigger, 
and intermediate villages also start getting into clusters. You need to say the connectivity exists up to 500 kilometers for all the sites to get connected. So there are clearly clusters in the urbanization. And the reason why clustering in urbanization is um, interesting is because even though there is cluster clusterization, there is still a very standardized use of technology and script. Okay? People living completely differently in different environments, like you said, across the guards and stuff like that, still use the same script. And that is what makes it fascinating. Middle East and Harappa, um, Nisha showed this example or you in far more detail, where they use the same script to write something that seems to be completely different. Because grammatically, it is different. And uh, Middle East does have large tablets, but they don't have anything in which Harappan script is written. There's this beautiful circular script, species, some of which are found in Harappa, but very few, okay? And the script from, uh, seals from Western, so, so if there is a dictionary, if there is really a Rosetta Stone of Indus script, it's not going to be in India, it's going to be in West Asia, because they need it to translate. Somehow within the country, within the landmass of South Asia, there were other ways in which com conveyed the compactness of information. So this is a seal that Hanisha showed. Writing uh, on seals is, is believed to have been transmitted to Harappa from West, for, to West Asia from Harappa. Okay, it is clearly therefore that Harappan civilization developed uh, developed as an isolated group, and yet they had very close contact with each of these. It's almost like the city states of Greece, but the area of Greece was so much smaller. The writing is uh, writing and other cultural parameters were highly standardized across the entire region. There is no sign, by the way, of um, religious places in Harappa. So we don't even know if they worshipped any gods, and if they did, how did they do that? It indicates a very high level of standardization, which was driven by consensus and not by war. This is not easy to achieve, and therefore that remains one of the biggest dilemma when you look at the script, that the very thinking process is very different from the thinking process that would subsequently follow. Problems with decipherment, Nisha has highlighted them. Uh, they are manifold, the writing is cryptic. We don't know if there is a language underneath it and if it, if it is a language, whether it is one language or multiple languages or how is the coding done. It probably could not be a single language for the obvious reason that there are these clusters, all of them following the same writing and language does not remain standardized over hundreds of kilometers. The syntax has the same flexibility as language and the writing is hardly standardized. There are no bilingual texts, there is no literary data, there are no poems or anything in Harappan, and there is no clear evidence of continuity. And like I said, a hundred and hundred odd um, uh, failed attempts have been there. Harappan script is mathematically shown to be highly structured and similar to the at least a formal language, if not a la formal language writing in itself. Uh, we know how to write in Harappan script, but even if we don't know um, what to write, in the sense that Nisha and I could have worked out saying that, look, let us assign this meaning to this sign, let us assign this meaning to this sign, and we could have exchanged notes which were grammatically correct with Harappan script. But that doesn't mean that they assign these values to these signs. So we know how to write in Harappan script, but we don't know how to read. Disappearance of writing, appearance and disappearance, both are dramatic. Appearance indicates the rise of a civilization. There are a lot of other evidences which show that there is a certain revision sudden rise of civilization. Disappearance could be for multiple reasons. Uh, probably the writing was uh, restricted to trained allies and the training system broke down. Maybe writing was no longer needed. Maybe uh, it was replaced by a simple form of writing which we have so far not been able to recognize or identify. And the disappearance apparently is as sudden as the decay of the culture. And in, in most cases, what happens is that when a city is depopulated, it is the rich who go first and then the poor people migrate. Here it is reverse. The entire townships along the river bank where presumably poorer people stayed because of flooding, etc., go out first and then the outer regions go out. Understanding the reason for their disappearance is a part of the story of trying to understand what Harappans wrote. And this is the language model. Somebody, we were talking about lunch table today. That there are various ideas of what kind of languages existed in India and how they transmitted and so on. But whether they were related to Harappans at all, we do not know. And already there are various evidences of different kinds of languages. Uh, while there is evidence of movement, there is really no evidence of um, 
other technology. So Harappans, for example, had no iron. It's a completely bronze age technology. They never reached iron, and they never had horses. Writing is highly coordinated, suggesting centralized teaching. Flexibility is that of linguistic writing. Long distance trade could be an obvious reason why this was done. So there is somebody who has done an analysis um, where he has taken the raw material from Harappan sites, done an elemental analysis, and to see where the mining goes. And some of the mines from which they mine this material go all the way to Afghanistan and beyond, like northern Afghanistan. They go to deep into the Gangetic Plain and even South India. So they were mining from all over the place. So trade would obviously be something. So there could be things like sending rice to Mohanjodaro written on these things. Uh, you need, and to write even these kind of things, you need near linguistic flexibility. Um, it is unlikely that the writing includes uh, literary works for obvious reasons. The relation between motifs and written material is not well understood. Bhaskar, of course, has some very good ideas, but they need to be tested. The script is used to express homogeneous, heterogeneous information. Nisha showed you these nine clusters into which the linguistic writing can be broken. So clearly, not just one kind of information was being written in that. The Harappan script had multiple uses and multiple users, and a centralized uh, education system that made sure that all this information got conveyed properly. But there are larger issues. Why write? is the first question. Writing involves cognitive and physical processes of both. To translate information and thought into symbol and references is not so easy. That is the earliest linguistics. Earlier script tend to be more like Chinese, where they use an individual symbol for individual idea, um, entity. The highly, um, it is highly sensitive to the information you wish to convey. And so, for example, in Indian languages, you will not find too many words for snow, while in the um, among the Eskimos, there are some 200 words for snow because they needed that. We didn't need that. The so a system of writing um, relies on many of the structures of knowledge that it wishes to represent, but the designing is independent of the language. Written language uh, may take uh, may take on characteristic distinction, uh, see, see distinction shape depending on what you are writing. And writing is also a series of physically inscribed objects. You are now attending a particular set of design to a particular meaning, and that requires a major intellectual change. Writing systems do not themselves constitute a language, and, uh, but a convention that is meant to inform other human beings over time and space. A commonly agreed convention has to be central to that story. We need to get a better, we need to, we need to get a better hold of the way Harappans thought and the way they were thinking uh, and behaving uh, before we can make sense of what was the purpose of the writing. So archaeologists have given us a fair amount of data, or at least, ideally we would of course like 15,000 lines, but at least they have given whatever they could. Uh, we about know about the syntax, we know about their sign modifiers, we know about the signs relation with other signs and so on. We know that um, you can get computers to learn it, Nisha showed you that model of machine which can, machine language which can, uh, unsupervised learning which can give you 75% accuracy about predicting science. Um, okay. However, it has to be put in the context of the cultural aspects to make sign of it, sign make sense of it because it, they, they seem to have a fundamentally different way of thinking. The final answer to Harappan writing may uh, well depend how, much, how we understand the rise and especially the decline of the civilization to know how they were thinking and approaching the subject. Uh, there are some indications including crude Harappan bronze in uh, Maharashtra, some suggestions of material from Harappan culture being available in South India, some also on the down the Gangetic plains, not just Yamuna, all the way down the Gangetic plain and stuff like that. But that evidence is small, it is not overwhelming to give you a continuity. So eastward migration data is there, southward migration data is there, but what they carried was very little of the original culture. Genetic data can help us find some patterns, uh, but large scale genetic data is yet to come. We only know that India consists of Indo-Europeans, um, Dravidians and um, Austro-Asians, but we really do not know in great detail to make a map of it. And then there's a possible scenario of decline of civilization, we like to know. So what are the possible scenarios? 
uh, drought is one of them disease is another thing economic collapse like i said another is another thing collapse of social structure is another thing disintegration of the society is another thing dispersal of population uh, but we need some new but uh, we still do not have a clear idea of what it is because villages are very vulnerable to minor changes in environment well cities are rugged cities are horrible for long term changes in environment you have to just empty the city but short term changes they are generally well protected because they have made lakes for themselves water protection sources and garbage sources and so on so uh, urban center can handle one or two years of monsoon uncertainty after all bangalore will survive this lack of monsoon and china uh, chennai survived a bad monsoon a few years ago on the other hand villages tend to get decimated so urban centers have a lot of rigidity or inertia depending on how you want to put it so we need to get map of we need to map out their original movement subsequent movement we need much more genetic data we need to know whether they have relation to the later tribals of india and so on we uh, we know harappan civilization was not destroyed by violence we know there is no evidence of standing army which is which is truly surprising uh, they seem to have existed almost like the city states of greece uh, but even city states of greece eventually fought each other there is no destruction of cities so for example if you go to dholavira there is an evidence that in the middle of their urbanization there was a major fire that seems to have destroyed the whole village but it was a whole city but it was rebuilt on top of the old one so there is a whole layer of ash mound dated to middle of harappan uh, mid middle of uh, dholavira's lifetime uh, it seems to have been a steep but systematic decline in activity so this is the graph that i i just showed you uh, and we really do not know why one suggestion is that maybe they were taken over by um, they became part of the vedic culture but that is difficult 27 ribbed horse i mentioned highly urbanized cities i mentioned uh, no clear indication of who they worship harappans ate a much wider variety of food stuff than is described in rukved um, there is no um, uh, vedic diet is far more limited than what the harappans ate the landscape described in vedic literature is more like that of central asia rather than india the rains in Sen uh, rains are central to harappan civilization while Ved vedic people do not appreciate rain they appreciate um, ice that is um, being warmed rather than rains bringing water by the time vedic culture comes in uh, comes to india harappan civilization seems to have declined so harappa the classical age for vedic period culture in india is about 13 1500 bc which is past the harappan civilization urbanization the second scenario is that harappans migrated to the to the south and that harappan script represents uh, dravidian uh, signature but the time difference um, is too much uh, the rise of dravidian culture is much much later than harappan death of harappan civilization sangam literature is about what 8 900 bc or so the distance between these regions is very large and what happened to intermediate region um, large land mass of narmada etc is an issue uh there are only very few examples if at all like i said of replication of harappan technology so basically one of the most interesting and fully aspect um fully explored aspects of harappan civilization is its connection with older mesopotamian and harappan culture civil sumerian cultures they are slightly older than harappans many harappans seem to have come through the bolan pass through southern uh, iranian farmers this culture is much older than Uh, have, must have influenced the harappans because there is genetic evidence of farmers of south iran being similar to the harappan people we know that harappans had close contact with them stylistic seals were in existence before harappan came into being but they made or made were circular seals the classical harappan seals are not to be seen anywhere uh, writing was originally invented in some 800 years even if you want to be very generous and there are 13 seals 30 seals in west asia which show in indus um, grammar in the signs being written so maybe there are some connection there uh so what are the harappan people are they Dravi what, what did they write uh was it dravidian language writing so mahadevan for example uh, spent a lifetime trying to see if it is dravidian and um, the evidence is not clear there are some who have suggested they are label tags name identifiers entity identifiers again that does not work there is somebody who suggested it is purely numeric trivial to show it doesn't work somebody who has claimed that it is random gibberish which is also nonsense 
Some people have tried to read Sanskrit into this literature, and none of these are consistent with the syntactic analysis that uh, Nisha presented. So how do you go from here, or where do you go from here? Uh, it is now clear that uh, writing is grammatically precise and versatile. The signs seem to be a mix of individual and compound signs. It is as the flexibility of linguistic writing. It is it has a known grammar which is now reasonably well understood, if not fully understood. No current model comes close to answering this question. No other no way forward. Um, the only one way forward to look. The only way to go forward probably may be synonyms or some other things. With computational linguistics, we may we may have a clearer idea of signs and the grammatical synonyms, and signs sorry, and signs that can replace um, other signs and so on. So Nisha showed you this whole bunch of synonyms. When you put part of the uh, string into um, unsupervised learned computer program and ask them, they tell you that the replacement sign can be any of these three. In another case, it says any of these three. Or in third case, it says any of these two, and so on. So these are all grammatical synonyms of the Indus script. But grammatical synonyms does not mean that meaning synonyms. So there could be linguistic synonyms. They essentially mean the same thing. They could be purely grammatical synonyms. Words that mean completely different things, but are grammatically identical. Or synonyms that look, uh, so synonyms that look different in particular should be of great interest. For example, I have food is one thing and I have chocolate is another thing. Chocolate and food will both turn up as synonyms in your unsupervised learning, but the meanings are different. On the other hand, I have clothes to wear or I have no clothes to wear are more than just grammatical synonyms. There is something profound to it. I have food to eat or I had food is another way in which synonyms may appear in slightly different uh, combination of signs. Within this lies a pattern that can reveal some of the patterns of writing and give more constraints to future development uh, decipherments. It should be noted that writing was um, almost certainly not as for single purpose. Only Nisha showed you these nine clusters. However, <coughs> in no language are there two synonyms that have identical meanings. They may have synonyms have similar meanings, but why would you invent two words to mean exactly the same thing? So even though synonyms would not be having identical meaning. Another thing, thing you can look at is that there are many examples where the same sign is repeated twice, uh, which is which doesn't happen in a normal language. So why are these sign pairs? Sometimes there are triplets together. In many cases, um, we have seen that um, the signs repeat themselves with itself immediately or at a distant location, but we don't know why. And if you you probably didn't notice it because Nisha flashed it fast, but in the nine clusters that she showed you, one of the clusters clearly has this doublets of uh, 345 in them. Which of these signs are um, uh, shown these characteristics? And, and not all the signs appear in pairs, only some signs appear in pairs, and we need to worry about why. Then there are complex signs, like the same human figure with all kinds of shapes and carriers and all that. Uh, we need to identify these um, signs to which additives are made, signs to which other signs are added, signs to which only additives are made, uh, and we need to show that. Nisha showed you that this uh, combining of signs was not shorthanding. It was not attempted to, it was not written to compress the writing, but there was the, the compounded signs clearly had a different meaning because the grammatical environment in which they appear is very different. We need to uh, get these isolated and studies. Then the size that have add-ons, again, Nisha told you that there are 21 of those which need to be looked at. Not all signs have additives, only some of the signs have additives, and some signs have some additives, some signs have some other additives. These are the elements that need to be looked at. And there, are, there also appear to be fewer signs where this needs to happen. So welcome to the problem. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can ask. Otherwise, you can go and take Thanks, a photograph. Thanks, Mayank. Uh, questions, comments? Yep. Yes. Sir, in one of the earlier slides, you had mentioned how this obsession with miniaturization is unique uh, to this particular uh, culture. Um, and it uh, reminded me of an example from current day, which is uh, that of the semiconductor industry, that much of the um, advancements that see uh, that, that we see in uh, the chips is because of 
the distance between two transistors being reduced uh, Correct. steadily uh, from hundreds of nanometers to now today it's three uh, three nanometers. Correct. And so, th th thinking along the same lines, could these seals represent the pinnacle of conveying information from that era? In principle, it's possible that they originally drew big things and then eventually made them more and more compact, but there is no evidence of these bigger pieces. When it appears, it suddenly appears as miniatures. So it seems also there is no physical reason why they would make a big thing small, except like I said, to carry it, it may be easier to carry and so on. But these are urban centers, they don't move around very easily. So why would they choose miniatures is something we don't know. It is not um, technology driven. On the other hand, a lot of technology must have driven these kind of structures. Thank you. A yeah, couple of thoughts. I mean, one is uh, the reason we only have these small seals could be that larger texts were on cloth or animal hide or something and has not survived. Uh, in principle, yes, of course. But then the pens with which they wrote would have survived. We have seen very little of any writing equipment which could have written on larger but texts. But if they used uh, quills or something, those wouldn't have survived either, right? Huh, I mean, but, um, yeah. so for example, we have fe seen long, st pen-like structures, and some people have even claimed they are pens. Um, you can find markings on the stone where they apparently tested the gold and so on. Okay. But uh, there, is, there is no evidence of anything big having been written. And, um, well, in principle you are right, but we have absolutely no evidence of that. Leather could have been one unit, because leather is a big industry in Harappa. Um, paper, I don't think they had, because in the sense that paper making requires a certain processing and stuff like that, which there is no evidence of paper. But they could have had leather. And I don't think anything in leather has survived from Harappan civilization. The other question I was thinking, if, if it is an Abhikura script, I mean, if, the, if these add-ons are like vowels, a lot of scripts actually don't include the vowels. I mean, some writing systems only have the consonants. Yes. So from the um, purpose of trying to decode it, supposing you strip off all the add-ons and only look at, you assume that whatever is left is a consonant. Uh, would some kind of pattern emerge from that? Has anyone tried to... Uh, so that pattern? is when uh, um, we are reduced to 35 signs from Harappan civilization. And those, the, the, the grammar of those 35 signs need to be systematically analyzed. We were just amused to see them as 35 different signs, but we haven't quite got around to hmm. looking at this so-called um, the grammar core signs, uh, core signs of this grammar. Plus, there is an additional problem that now it is not just a question of additives. Some signs are merged, and that makes life very miserable. Okay, thanks. Uh, Pascal, you had a comment to me? Uh, yeah. uh, this is more, a, more of a comment than a question, really. Um, the thing is, the data set available for any kind of the data set available to you all for any kind of analysis today is actually a very limited data set. Uh, not in the sense of samples missing, but in the sense of a lot of background information missing. And uh, a lot of this background information actually decides what to begin with writing is. Um, for instance, the so-called writing that we see on, on Indus is really of two types. One is freestyle scrawling on pottery graffiti and copper artifacts. Uh, the other is really on seals and seal impressions, which are not freestyle writing at all, which is probably on a slab, little slab. It's scrawled first with a softer uh, or, or a sharper, sharper uh, implement. And then it's actually scooped out, carved out, um, right? And so there have been many attempts to um, understand direction of writing from the scooping. Uh, scooping does not have to begin in any one direction. It can begin anywhere on, on, on a seal, depending on the ergonomic uh, um, uh, aspects of how a seal carver actually digs the material out. Uh, so there, there's a lot of background information that is actually missing for um, conclusive productive analysis such as uh, one would like to undertake today. Uh, 
which, however, does not mean um, there is absence of evidence. In fact, I believe there's more information than necessary today to actually understand the complete contents of the Indus seal impressions. I, and, and here I don't distinguish the visual content from the textual content. And the, the complete disassociation between the two is probably the reason for the delay in our understanding of, of the Indus material itself. Uh, because it's, it's, it's kind of unsuspected that there could be a connection between this and that. Um, uh, in fact, some of them have actually been dismissed, uh, saying there is no connection between this and that. This is something else. This is a magical symbol. Uh, this is religious, uh, totemic, or something like that. And this is completely independent of that. No. Uh, if you look at it closely, there is a very clear one-to-one -one correspondence. And on many seals, there is actually an A for apple kind of an explanation. On, there are 33 seals in Indus. Um, out of 5,538 artifacts that we get today, the, in, in, on 33 seals, the sign is not written on top of the animal, but in front of the animal. Uh, these 33 actually show a direct relationship between uh, uh, an A for apple kind of relationship. And once, with that, what we can do is we can assemble a sorcerian set, uh, a, a pre-linguistic a set, non-phonetic set, saying that, okay, this sign is actually legitimately a sign because it has a random correspondence with the visual and have a saucerian set. And from the saucerian set only, we can actually build further on. I mean, that's roughly the understanding uh, uh, that we get today uh, 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 from going through these limited corpuses available. Slightly unrelated, but um, if you look at the uh, so if you talk about the prosperity of the civilization, does it like vary significantly across space? Or um, is it like each site was comparably prosperous? No, that's okay. So there are there are fourteen characteristics that define the Harappan civilization. One interesting thing is the bricks, the house, the the bricks with which they made their houses, etc. Had an exact one is to two is to four. Um, ratio and that is across the board across the one million square kilometers you find it the same the knives that they used were also highly standardized so there is a very high degree of standardization orthogonal streets etc are also there jewelry decorations are also very similar so some sites must have been richer some must have been poorer but stylistically they remain the same also there are sites like Mohanjo Daro we, we talk about a great Egyptian um, architecture but Mohanjo Daro is a completely artificial site a yeah, mount was created in the middle of a river bed and then the entire city was built on top of that mount and it has orthogonal streets and stuff like that. So there must have been poverty and there must have been richness. There are, the, for example, each of these sites has a citadel where the powerful, potentially the king or whoever was staying and the rest of the people lived in much smaller, much poorer houses. So there was definitely proper economic stratification in that area. So that is it Sorry? viable that the failure of one site uh -huh. or one centralized system could lead to a collapse of something like a cascade. Yeah, so one, one obvious thinking is that that Gagar Hakra that I showed you, probably um, it came from the Himalayan mountain ranges apparently and an earthquake somewhere either at the top or at the middle level made Yamuna go to the east instead of coming south any further. So it stopped, a major river stopped feeding the culture. So this entire all the urban centers in one region had collapsed. They probably tried and settled in the other, in the Indus plain, overpopulated and destroyed their culture also. That is one of the ideas. The second is some unknown disease ran through the place. The third is that they were dependent essentially on commerce with Europe, with uh, West Asia. The problem is for every evidence that you show me in favor of that idea, I will show you another evidence that doesn't agree with that idea. That is a problem. And uh, you mentioned something about, you know, generally you see the uh, that the rich usually gets wiped out and the poor migrate. Mm. But here it's the opposite. Sorry, sorry? You mentioned that in this case it's the opposite. Huh. Yes. Right? Uh, well, what was the basis? Um, reason we don't know. We have that. The idea is that generally if, the, if a place becomes difficult to live, people start finding, uh, rich people would find, start finding other places to go and live where it is more comfortable. 
and they would have the resources to do that. While the poor would essentially try to trudge on as much as they can in the given environment. Here what happens is that apparently the, um, the less fortunate seem to have left the city before the rich did. So for example, there are no evidences of dead bodies lying here and there. There are no undisposed bodies except of people who came later just wandering at the site and died. Those kind of rare examples exist. But in general, large scale unattended bodies are not found in any of these sites. Forget about wounds, for not even by illness or age. So people seem to have migrated out in a groups. The entire lot went away, which is unusual. Also, the number of artifacts that you find in these sites, is it unusually low for uh, these particular regions or is this what you expect in any archaeological survey? Generally? That is a question. So, for example, per square foot if you are per thousand of population, whether you find more artifacts in Mesopotamia or India, that's a question you are asking. I mean, and do you significantly find lower artifacts in these regions compared to, say, other some other? Uh, I don't know the answer. I really don't. In the sense that if you are asking me for per thousand population, did um, Mesopotamians have more variety of artifacts, etc., compared to Harappans, I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. The, I mean, I could guess the answer and I think it would be comparable, but I won't bet much on it. Any other questions? Oh, okay. okay. If not, let's thank Mayank once more. <laughs> All right. So before we get our coffee, can I just request everyone to assemble outside uh, for a group photo? So where should they go? Sir, maybe. Just tell everyone where, where the photo is under the hood. Portico. Uh, portico yeah. Okay. Just, just in front here. 